We've all been there. You're driving along when something happens. Today, we're gonna look at the main thing that saves your butt in situations like that. Your brakes. All right, everybody bring it in. And brakes! The core concept of a vehicle's braking system is simple. An object is in motion and it needs to stop being in motion. Brakes use friction to decelerate. The wheel has energy in the form of movement. The brakes apply friction and create heat energy. Once all the movement energy is transformed into heat, your car stops. It's not magic, it's physics. To stop, you need friction. This simple concept is what almost all vehicles share in their efforts to come to a stop. What isn't shared between vehicles is how that friction is applied after the pedals pressed. The very first brakes were just pieces of wood that pushed on the wheels. It worked, but it wasn't that great because it beat the crap out of the wheel. The simple solution was to attach something to the wheel and slow that down. In 1900, Wilhelm Maybach became the first car maker to put a drum on a wheel to assist with braking. Slowing down the drum meant the wheel wouldn't take the wear. Good thinking, guys. Here's what a drum brake looks like. This drum is attached to the wheel. Inside of it are these two heat-resistant pads. When you press the brake pedal, these pads are squeezed up against the drum. The pads slow the drum, and the drum stops the wheel. Early cars also used a bunch of cables and pulleys to get the pressure from the pedal to the wheel. When you pushed the pedal, it pulled the cable. And the brake wires needed a lot of maintenance, and often they snapped when you needed them the most. Another downside was the precision required. If a lever was off or a wire was tensioned wrong, the different wheels would receive different braking pressures, and that's just unsafe. Hydraulic brakes, on the other hand, use pressurized fluid to push the brakes. When you hit the pedal, a plunger depresses in the master cylinder. That sends the pressure through all of the brake lines to all four wheels at once. Hydraulic brake lines rarely rupture. They don't require the maintenance of mechanical lines, and they require required very little pressure from the pedal to be effective. And by 1950, hydraulic brakes were really the only braking systems left in cars. Drum brakes were pretty good, and we used them in most of the production cars up into the 80s. Their major drawback, however, was that under intense conditions with frequent braking, they got really hot. If they're too hot, they can't change the energy of motion into heat. That's bad, because that's when you need them the most. Well, let's build some better brakes. An increased coefficient means better braking, but it also means you need better cooling. One way to create more friction is with the materials in the pad. Pads have to be strong enough to stop a wheel, but soft enough not to damage the drum or sound like death. <laughs> Another way to increase friction is to apply more pressure. Drum brakes push out. The brain trust making brakes realized you can create more pressure by squeezing in. And lastly, you have to increase surface area. A greater surface area means more friction. The best way to improve friction and avoid heat is lose the drum, squeeze to a stop, and increase surface area. So instead of a drum, they use a disc. The disc, or rotor, is attached to the wheel and rides inside a caliper. The caliper squeezes the brake pads against the rotor and the wheel comes to a stop. Disc brakes cool off better because they're not inside of a drum. The air cools them. The bigger the brake and caliper combination is, the more friction they can generate and the more easily they can dissipate the heat. Like many automotive advancements, the first disc brakes used in racing were in Formula One in 1951. In 1955, Citroën became the first company to put them on production cars. They were more expensive to manufacture, but as cars became faster, disc brakes became necessary. That's not to say that drum brakes are more dangerous. We still use drum brakes. When a vehicle slows, its weight gets transferred mostly to the front axle. The front brake usually does about 70% of the work, leaving the back brakes with a lighter load. <laughs> James, what are you doing, man? What are you doing driving in the friggin' street? Uh, sorry I almost hit you. We cool? <laughs> Because drum brakes are cheaper and simpler to produce and maintain, most automakers use them on lighter cars or entry-level models because, well, 
because they're adequate. The rotors can have any number of tweaks to make them more effective, and most of them have to do with getting rid of that heat energy. Some have a gap in the middle to let air in. Some have fins in this gap to pull air in. And some would have holes all around so that they could let air in and out all over the place. Your car's brakes probably won't get above 400 degrees, which is still super hot. That would cook a pizza in 50 seconds. It's pizza. Most pads are made of semi-metallic materials, synthetics mixed with different proportions of flaked metals. Race disc brakes can reach temps over 1,000 degrees. So race pads are composed of sintered steel without any synthetic additives. They work best at high temperatures because the demand on them is so high. If you put them on your daily, they're gonna squeal like heck. Just ask Tony. It's horrible, right? Tony. He's got his headphones on. If your brakes squeal, that usually means you're almost out of pad. Manufacturers put an indicator in them, so they shriek like a banshee. <laughs> Even if it turns out that that's not the issue, squealing brakes means something's not right. They could be vibrating and not lined up right. Or maybe some foreign matter got in there. And that can cause pretty big damage in the long run. Ever since we started going fast, we had to look for better ways to stop. I mean, we've come a long way from just smashing wood on wheels. So appreciate your brakes, because they keep you from being dead. OK, I guess it's time to put a stop to this episode of Science Garage. Nolan wrote that. Thanks to Skillshare for sponsoring this episode. Look, if you're watching Science Garage, you like learning. And if you like learning, you'll love Skillshare. Skillshare is an online learning community with thousands of classes in design, business, technology, and more. You wanna make cool motion graphics of a brake drum? Well, they got courses for that. You wanna make sick beats like our background music? Well, then you can learn how to mix music with Young Guru. I am telling you, the instructors on here know what they're doing. Premium membership gives you unlimited access to high quality classes on must know topics so you can improve your skills, unlock new opportunities, and do the work that you love. Skillshare is also more affordable than most learning platforms out there. An annual subscription is less than $10 a month. That is crazy. That's less than two double pump half cat mocha lattes. And what's even better is that the first 1,000 people to sign up with the link in the description will get their first two months for 99 cents. So go to http colon forward slash forward slash skl dot sh forward slash science garage or click on the link in the description. Go get skilled. Get Skillshare. Guys, thanks for talking with me today about how brakes work. Subscribe to Donut. If you guys want to know some of the best modifications you can do to your own car, check out this vid from Tony. If you guys want to know other stuff about safety, check out this video about helmets. If you guys like this shirt or you want a sticker, go to shop.donut.media. We do a lot of fun stuff. If you want to see more of it, guys, follow us on Instagram, at Donut Media. You can follow me on Instagram, at Bids Bardo. I love reading your comments. I love talking to you guys. Thanks for watching. Don't tell my wife I took her brakes. They'll be on tomorrow. <laughs>